How do you approach the child who may be altered? Sure, general gestalt is great, but how can we be sure we're not being led down the primrose path of, it's late, he's probably just really tired? Let's talk about what to do when the kid's not all right. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Altered mental status in children can be subtle. An infant may be irritable or just very sleepy. A toddler may be angry and moody, so that narrows it down. A school-aged child may show slow signs of decline with sleep disturbances, with poor school performances or personality changes. A teenager may... Well, well, bets are off with teenagers, but one thing we should be careful with in teens is that altered mental status is not all drugs and alcohol. Give them the benefit of the doubt. For now. The main themes for today are these. When you're assessing altered mental status, keep your mind open, your wits about you, and know that your worst enemy here is anchoring bias. Think broadly, go down multiple paths of investigation simultaneously until some winnow off, but always be ready to rethink your approach completely if it's just not all adding up. Bobby is a 16-month-old boy who is brought in by his parents. They say he's just not acting himself today. He's a normal, thriving toddler without past medical history. The parents tell you they were having a nice, lazy weekend morning today. Johnny got up early, but since this afternoon, he hasn't wanted to eat anything, and he's been really sleepy and not wanting to do anything. After a nap of four hours, they couldn't get him to stay awake. From what the parents tell you, today was just like any other day. No history of illness, no trauma, or really anything. When trying to get a good history, we try, we really try, to let patients speak. But we fail, we really fail, and we're all familiar with the landmark study by Beckman et al., that tells us that the average time we allow patients to speak freely at the beginning of a clinical encounter is 18 seconds. We feel kind of absolved of this in emergency medicine because there are times when we do have to ask pointed questions and perform a focused exam to build up some diagnostic forward momentum. During clinical encounters like these, you know, when we're just not really getting anywhere, I like to open it up. Ask, how are things at home? Pause. Ask, who's living with you at home? Pause. Even ask, is there anything else I should know to help take better care of you? Pause. Let it be awkward for a moment. Kind of like in a crime scene, what they say next may be revealing and it may help you to follow another, more productive line of questioning. Well, it turns out, Grandma is living with Johnny, his older sister, and their parents. Grandma takes oral medications for her diabetes, something for her high blood pressure, some patches she uses, and of course, multivitamins. When you look at Johnny, he's stuporous. He's not alert, and surprisingly, he responds only to frequent, painful stimuli. His work of breathing and circulation to his skin are normal. You check a blood sugar, normal. Vital signs are reasonable for his age with a heart rate of 100, blood pressure 80 over 60, respiratory rate 22, O2 sat 98%, he's afebrile. On exam, Johnny is truly lethargic. 
not the vernacular term that some people use to describe the cranky toddler who's actually buzzing around the room and who may just need a nap. This is LP-worthy lethargy. There is a pediatric version of the Glasgow Coma Scale, but like its parent, it's limited in its application to emergency care. A better performing and thankfully simpler way to estimate mental status in a child is the AVPU scale. A, V, P, U. The further you go in the acronym, the worse your mental status is. Is the child alert? Does he respond to verbal stimuli? Painful stimuli? Is he unresponsive? On the AVPU scale, Johnny is P. He responds to painful stimuli. His pupils are reactive. The rest of his exam is not helpful. So what's going on here? We can safely say that this child is altered, but why? And what are our next steps? In adolescents and adults, when I say altered, you say A-E-I-O-U tips, the mnemonic we all know and love. Alcohol, epilepsy, insulin, overdose, uremia, trauma, infection, psychosis, stroke. But does that work for children? As you'll hear me say many times, children are not another species, and you have all the skills you need to take good care of them. Use what you know to get to where you need to be. You can see, though, that this mnemonic can be tailored a little bit for children. So here's a helpful mnemonic for kids. They all need to eat well, grow up strong, and take their vitamins. V. Vascular. I. Infection. T. Toxins. A. Accident or abuse. M. Metabolic. I. Intussusception. N. Neoplasm. S. Seizures. Using vitamins helps us to key in on what is more likely to be the cause of altered mental status in children. So let's run Johnny through this one. V for vascular. Does he have any comorbidities for stroke, perhaps an arterial venous malformation? Is there systemic evidence of vasculitis? I, infection. Sepsis is always a concern when we see a sick child, and we think even more specifically about meningoencephalitis or brain abscess here. Do a thorough check of the eyes, ears, nose, throat, the chest, abdomen, rectum, GU, and skin. Look everywhere. T for toxins. Little kids are always getting into things. Knowing that grandma and her meds are around may be useful information. A. Accident or abuse. Accidental or non-accidental trauma may be at play. It's helpful to know that a large proportion of intracranial, intrathoracic, and intraabdominal trauma in children may not show signs of external trauma due to their elastic and pliable little frames. M. Metabolic. Is this the presentation of DKA? Is there some other endocrine or inborn error of metabolism that's brewing. What about hypothyroidism? I. Intussusception. Now, you may have the image in your mind of the inconsolable infant or toddler with abdominal pain. Now, that's true, but remember, there's another variation in presentation with intussusception. The somnolent toddler whose intestines are telescoped into themselves, smashing the neuronal plexus of the gut and releasing feel-good endorphins that are giving him a nice little high. N. Neoplasm Newly diagnosed children with ALL 
may arrive altered and septic. Similarly, fast-growing solid tumors are hypermetabolic and eat up the child's glucose stores. S. Seizures We're all good at recognizing the post-ictal state, but seizures in the infant and toddler can be subtle, and they may present as, he's just not himself. All right, based on your probing questions, you narrow Johnny's differential down to toxins and maybe intussusception. You establish an IV, draw labs for chemistries, blood count, liver function, ammonia, get a urinalysis, and you order that ultrasound, and grandma arrives. She's out of breath and tearful and says, I think my grandbaby chewed on my patches. Sure enough, she produces a slobbery, gnawed up clonidine patch. Remember that most transdermal medications offer inconsistent administration of meds, and they're often discarded with up to 75% of the medication still intact even after a week on the skin. In this case, Grandma had dutifully thrown her patch away, but Johnny is no stranger to the wastebasket. He got into it, and there you have your altered toddler. You counsel your ultrasound and re-examine. Yes, his pupils are small. You could say meiotic. His current respiratory rate of 12 is actually a bit slow for his age, now that you think about it. And his O2-sat luckily is normal still. His peripheral perfusion is still good. Clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist with many therapeutic indications, including hypertension, alcohol withdrawal, smoking cessation, perimenopausal symptoms, and in children specifically for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, spasticity due to a neurologic cause such as cerebral palsy, and Tourette syndrome. The classic clonidine toxidrome is altered mental status, meiosis, hypotension, bradycardia, and bradypnea. Basically, in clonidine, everything is dialed down. In children, clonidine is on the infamous list of one pill can kill. If a pill is ingested, then consider activated charcoal if early on, and you're a believer, give supportive care and potentially naloxone can be used. If a patch is ingested, think about the risk of an extended release of the medication as it travels through the gut, maybe even causing a higher exposure from a prolonged transit time due to an opioid-like bowel obstruction. These patients may need more aggressive interventions, such as airway management and whole bowel irrigation. In cases of patch ingestion, the clinical trajectory may not be so predictable. Naloxone is great, but it should be used judiciously, as we've all seen the overzealous use of Narcan go bad. It's not a Lazarus drug. We have to be careful and aware of the potential for extreme hypertension, for pulmonary edema, for atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias, and even cardiac arrest in large doses. In most cases like this one, Consider using it for the opioid toxidrome overdose with hemodynamic instability like bradycardia, hypotension, or to stave off intubation. Although clonidine overdose management is mostly supportive, we can also use naloxone to address hemodynamic instability like we do in an opioid overdose. You may say, hey, wait a minute. Clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. What does naloxone have to do with clonidine? Recall that alpha-1 agonists, for example, phenylephrine, spike up your blood pressure. And alpha-2 agonists, like clonidine, are the yin to the alpha-1 yang. Alpha-2 agonists are the negative feedback that brings down the BP, 
which is why clonidine can be used for the management of hypertension. So why do we use naloxone, which is an opioid mu receptor antagonist, to reverse clonidine? The toxicologist's dirty little secret is, we don't really know. Here's the hypothesized connection. It's all about the endogenous opioids. The best current thinking is that some of clonidine's therapeutic effects are through the release of endogenous opioids peripherally and centrally, specifically in the ventral medulla and the locus ceruleus, your brain's panic button. It's the principal site for your brain's synthesis of norepinephrine and where all of your stress and anxiety comes from. Clonidine causes extra endogenous opioids to circulate around, on top of the primary alpha-2 effects. In an overdose of clonidine, if we can at least block the opioid receptors, we can take a bit of the cream off the top. That's why we see a partial effect of naloxone on clonidine overdose, and why we often have to give more of it in this situation. Now, we don't see this too often, so let's just keep it simple. You remember the typical initial naloxone dose for opioids, right? 0.01 milligrams per kilogram per dose, up to the initial adult dose of 0.4 milligrams. Just go with what you know and add from there if you need to. As you know, naloxone dosing is all over the place when you look at the references. Start low, and if you see some therapeutic improvement, such as improved respiratory effort or improvement in vital signs, then you can always titrate to effect. Having said that, if your patient is profoundly bradycardic or hypotensive with poor perfusion from a clonidine overdose, you'll likely have to give more naloxone than usual to stabilize him, up to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram a tenfold increase than if it were a simple opioid overdose. Just do so carefully, and you know, it's always better to look up the dose. It can get confusing in the heat of the moment. Just remember that overdose reversal is a lot like cooking. You can always add, but it's hard to take away. Season to taste. You don't want to ruin the whole stew. We're giving naloxone to address Hemodynamic instability, not the patient's ability to do calculus. I still can't. Johnny is respiring sufficiently and his circulation is adequate. We're going to hold off on the naloxone. Remember, our goal is to support him, not focus on the dosing of an incomplete indirect antidote. You decide to observe him, his labs are all normal, and he steadily improves his mental status enough to de-escalate your investigation. But he's still somnolent and you admit him overnight. If needed, a social worker in-house can further screen for other issues like neglect, but you don't suspect it here and maybe the social worker can help the family to toddler-proof the house. Jack is a seven-year-old boy brought in by his mother when she found him lying on the bathroom floor, vomiting. Jack has had a fever for the past day or so, and he's only complained of a sore throat. His mother noticed that he stayed in bed all day, not even wanting to watch television with the family. She tried giving him an antipyretic, but he refused it. He's gotten worse, and scared she brings him into the ED. He has no other past medical history. When you walk into the room, you see that Jack is curled up in the gurney. His sheet is covering him up to his ears. He's faced away from his mother. You go to greet him and gently place your hand on his arm. He becomes wildly upset and screams at you. Curiously, he settles quickly and assumes his previous almost fetal position. You're unfazed, you've seen worse, and you carefully work around this delicate situation, placing the stethoscope 
stealthily onto his back to listen to his lungs. His skin is warm and maybe even a bit flushed. He's a little diaphoretic, and you think, well, you know, he has been febrile. Do you dare to look into his ears? Yes, slowly, carefully, you see some opaque fluid behind the tympanic membranes, but nothing else. He now seems to be letting you do more, or at least you hope that he's letting you. His abdomen is soft, it's non-tender. Finally, you venture to go looking into his throat. This time he fusses a bit, but he doesn't give up much of a fight. Jack has a little erythema in his oral pharynx without edema or exudate. It's strep again, right? Asks his mom, desperate for an answer. You want to reassure her, but you can't. With concern and some compassion, you tell her that he is just too sick to leave it at that. Based on what we know so far, do we have a good grasp of what's going on with Johnny? The pitfall here would be to ascribe all of his signs and symptoms to just being miserably febrile and acutely sick with... What? What was that? Ah, yes, our favorite diagnosis, viral syndrome. We need to go further. Why can't this child have meningoencephalitis? He's delirious. He's febrile. He's irritable. Now here's a question for you. Should you obtain a CT of his brain before you perform lumbar puncture? I'd say this. If you were going to perform a computerized tomography of the brain anyway because the differential diagnosis was still open and you were concerned about tumor, hemorrhage, or abscess, then yes, by all means, please complete your workup and preferentially get that CT before your LP. Is that the case here? Well, let's see. Vitamins. No vascular issues that you're concerned for. Infection is likely. Toxins, unlikely, but those labs are cooking. Accident or abuse, nothing there. Metabolic, not likely this is a previously healthy child, but you'll have some supplemental lab information soon enough. Intussusception, he's kind of old for that. Neoplasm, again, he was fine until today. Seizures, no evidence of that. So, you get ready to perform your LP. And of course, someone asks you in the middle of setting up, did you want to get a CT? It's not a bad question. All of this consternation stems from a landmark article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001 by Hasbun et al. that found that there were no bad outcomes in adults with suspected meningitis if they had none of the following. Age over 60, immunocompromise, history of CNS disease, seizure within one week before presentation, abnormal level of consciousness, an ability to answer two consecutive questions correctly or to follow two consecutive commands, gaze palsy, abnormal visual fields, facial palsy, arm drift, leg drift, and abnormal language. You get the idea. So in Jack's case, he is altered, and it would not necessarily be wrong to CT before LP. Having said that, CT is not a test for increased intracranial pressure. Anyone can herniate regardless of their CT findings. Conversely, mass effect does not necessarily predict herniation. Playing devil's advocate, CT may add unnecessary delays to treatment and then there's the radiation. Okay, I feel like I'm messing with you a little bit. Jack is altered. We think we have an answer in meningoencephalitis, but we truly don't know. He gets a CT. In the meantime, he's treated with ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and acyclovir. Luckily, his CT shows no bleed, no mass, and no indirect signs of abscess. During his hospital course, Jack got it all. He was negative for the usual suspects, strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitidis, and the luckily now less common Haemophilus influenzae. Viral titers were sent off for arboviruses, herpes simplex, 
non-polio enterovirus, mumps, and Epstein-Barr. Little Jack recovered in the ICU over the next several days, and luckily he had no sequelae. None of the fancy lab work showed the reason for his altered mental status. Except for one. It was a simple, inexpensive point-of-care test that we did in the ED. Some may scoff at it, but in this case, it was the key to everything. Jack was positive for influenza B. Yes, influenza was what messed him up so bad. Influenza is often overlooked as a potential cause of altered mental status. In a 2008 study from Toronto, Canada, 5% of children with newly diagnosed encephalitis or encephalopathy were found to have evidence of a current influenza infection. Fever was found to be the most common prodromal symptom occurring in all patients, followed by cough and vomiting. Many authors report a broad array of neurologic manifestations associated with influenza, such as altered mental status, seizures, cranial nerve abnormalities, hallucinations, abnormal behavior, and persistent irritability. All of this is due to a hypercytokinemic state. Cytokines are bombarding you with their evil humors. The altered mental status in flu is a holistic attack, not a primary CNS infection. Go figure. The moral of the story is not to say that it's probably all just the flu. The moral is that we have to keep our differential broad in altered mental status. We prepared for the worst, and luckily it turned out to be the best for young Jack. Monique is a 14-year-old girl who is brought in by her foster mother for not listening to her. According to her, Monique has been acting crazy for the past few days, and her foster mother is at her wit's end. According to the foster mom, Monique has had a rough family situation in the past, with a few psychiatric evaluations over the years, but never a psychiatric diagnosis. Monique has mostly struggled with adjustment and behavioral issues. Now that you're at the bedside, you can sense the tension in the room and you can see that there must be multiple layers there. The foster mother announces that she wants her committed. When you approach Monique, she snaps and you can see what foster mom is saying. Monique yells out some gibberish, then surprisingly, belts out a love song, but aggressively in your face. It was the kind of on-cue weird performance that would almost be comical if she weren't obviously sick. Monique thrashes around in the bed. You get her some benzos and she seems to settle for now. Ma'am, could she have taken anything? Foster mom says no, then sheepishly admits that she allows Monique to smoke marijuana in the home, since she does too. Does she have any medications that she takes? Foster mom says, not really. Not really. Uh, what do you mean by that, ma'am? She replies that Monique hasn't had any meds in quite some time. You push further and find that Monique hated taking one particular medication because it made her gain weight. Her foster mother pulls out some crumpled pharmacy receipt from the bottom of her purse. And you see it all there. Her prednisone, her hydroxychloroquine, and her mycophenolate. All for her systemic lupus erythematosus. A game changer. Her would-be med list. So you still go through your vitamins, mnemonic, but your running hypothesis now is lupus cerebritis.
SLE is rare in young children, for example, those under five years of age, but it definitely affects school-age children. In fact, compared to adults, children tend to have more severe symptoms of lupus, and there's typically a greater chance of vital organ involvement. They can get really sick with lupus. In the teenage years, lupus presents much like it does in adults with a wide range of symptomatology. Monique has a low-grade fever of 38.1, and her heart rate ranges from 90 to 130 when she's upset. There's no evidence of trauma. She doesn't appear to have meningismus. I mean, she intermittently, spontaneously becomes animated, then somnolent. Her skin is normal and well-perfused. Her abdomen appears soft and non-tender. You cover her for possible meningitis and sedate her for her head CT. While Monique is still in the CT gantry, you take a quick look on the radiology tech screen. No bleed, no tumor, ventricles are normal, gray-white differentiation is normal. She's still sedated, so you take the opportunity to bring her back to the room to perform your lumbar puncture. Her CSF is unremarkable. Her complete blood count shows anemia with a hemoglobin of 9 grams per deciliter, 90 grams per liter, a mean corpuscular volume of 74.1 femtoliters, and a white blood cell count of 4.5. The clincher for us in the ED, her erythrocyte sedimentation rate, one of the few rheumatologic studies we can get in the ED, was elevated at 94 millimeters per hour. Now, lupus cerebritis, along with thyroid storm and some choice others, is one of the few endocrine emergencies that we have to get our consultants on board as soon as possible. Monique receives high-dose IV steroids for presumed lupus cerebritis, and you weigh the risks of giving corticosteroids in the face of a possible infection, but you realize that we still need to cover for both now. Her airway continues to be safe, and you're careful with her fluid status, and you also give her some symptomatic relief of her delirium. You're careful with the benzos, but she seemed to respond well to them, and you give a small amount of haloperidol, knowing that, like most first and second generation antipsychotics, it can lower the seizure threshold, especially in those who are at risk for seizures, but Haloperidol is a second-generation antipsychotic, and it does connote lower risk than the first generation. A small dose hits the spot for Monique. She's stabilized, and you speak with the ICU team. You get the endocrinologist and nephrologist on board early. This helped her get started on plasmapheresis. In the case of lupus cerebritis, specifically total plasma exchange, during which the plasma is filtered out and replaced with the donors. The goal is to remove autoantibodies, complement, interferon alpha, and immune complexes to take away the fuel of the fire in this autoimmune blaze. All of her other labs were consistent. She had low C3 and C4 levels with high anti-double-stranded DNA and high anti-Smith levels. We even sent for NMDA receptor antibodies, which were negative. Other studies such as TSH and the whole gamut of CSF cultures and PCRs were all negative. Monique has a rocky course in the ICU. She became fluid overloaded over the next several days despite treatment and needed endotracheal intubation. She battled through renal failure, acute heart failure, and a stubborn catheter-associated infection. Aren't you glad we didn't just send her to psychiatry? A month later, she was back to her sweet, smiling self on the ward. There was still plenty of work to do, but you were glad that you were there to help her when she needed you. So remember, not acting right could mean altered mental status in children. If your pediatric patient is altered, 
think broadly and be ready to pivot as new information unfolds. AEIOU tips in adults will do nicely, but a pediatric-specific mnemonic for altered mental status will help us out even more. To stay healthy, clear of mind, and not altered, take your vitamins. Vascular, infection, toxins, accident or abuse, metabolic, intussusception, neoplasm, and seizure. Thank you for listening. On a personal note, I've gotten such great feedback from you. And if you can believe it, we have listeners in over 110 countries worldwide. It humbles me and reminds me that we're all part of a larger community. Let's keep the conversation going. I just want to say that I appreciate your taking the time out of your busy day to spend with me and for your trust and interaction. Okay, keep up the great work out there. And until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.